This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion Adrian Martinez. If you can wake up, sir, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Alex, it's an honor to be here, and I thank you. I thank you for coming back on the show, my friend. It's been it's been a few years since you've been on the show. Uh, you were uh, you were on early, early on because uh, you know we we knew each other from Nalip and uh, and and worked a little bit together on on that stuff back then. And I asked yeah. I asked you know a giant in the field like yourself to come and hum hu- to my humble podcast to to talk shop back then. And now you're back, sir. And I appreciate you then, and I appreciate you now. Well, I I couldn't be more grateful to speak to you because you know movies. <laughs> and you know the price we all paid to make them. <laughs> and so I'm grateful to be here. Yeah, and we're going to talk about your new film, which is your directorial wow. debut, I, Gilbert, uh, in a little bit, uh, which is... Uh, which I loved, by the way, and I, I'm sure there's a couple stories. I'm sure it was very easy to to make, and it, it ran around very quickly. Um, it, it, I'm sure the money just flowed in, and you shot it what in like a weekend. Um, it got all the, all the actors just showed up. It was great, yeah, and, and yeah, I'm sure, and it got released. I'm quickly. shooting it right now, like this is part of it. <laughs> this is part of the film. So, for people who don't, uh, who aren't aware of your career, how did you get started in the business, man? I was a complete and abysmal failure at everything else. Uh, then uh, I actually started as a teenager uh, and I was a high school sprinter. And uh, believe it or not, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, they were going around schools putting up signs for a uh, crime reenactment show called Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, and yes. they were looking for sprinters. So my friend said, yo, you're the fastest one here. You should do it. And I was like, eh, I don't know. Uh, they're going to pay you like $500 for the day. All right, where do I go? <laughs> and so uh, the whole audition was a sprint, literally, like a 40-yard sprint. And, yeah, I was a medalist, and I left everyone in the dust, and I and I booked it. And I became SAG eligible. And uh, now just... 87 years later, I'm directing my movie. <laughs> but but were, did you use did you were you method when you were right when you were running and, and sprinting uh, at the time? Uh, did you what kind of acting techniques did you use? <laughs> uh, I uh, I said go for the money, go for the money, go, go for the money. So I had an I had an objective. Yeah, there was an objective, no question. Now you've worked with some of the best directors in the business over your long career. I mean, you're one of those actors who. I constantly see pop up everywhere. You're just one of those actors who's always working, and it's so I'm fun. I'm standing behind you. I'm so, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're like David Pumpkins. You're like sitting. You're standing right behind me. Um, but but it's true because I, you know, I'll be watching a movie or a show on you know on TV and with my wife, and I'm like, oh, there's Adrian. Oh, there's Adrian. and it always puts a smile on my face. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. He's still he's cranking along. I love it, and I love. What you you know when you're doing your your thing, and by the way, there is nobody else like you. Like you 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 have no competition. <laughs> Let's just keep it that way. <laughs> There's not an Adrian Martinez type. Like you are a. There is nobody else like you. You have such a unique um, energy to you to you uh, and everything you do. So, but all these shows you've worked on, all these movies you worked on, you work with some of the best directors in the business. What were some of the lessons you learned watching them that brought that you were able to bring into directing your first feature? Well, I tell you, when I worked with uh, Ben Stiller on <laughs> The Chico Life of Walter Mitty, I learned <sighs> all about hard work because he produced it, he directed it, he starred in it, and he was the first one to show up, the last one to leave, and then he would go work on the edit. And I just I just stayed on him like, like white on rice, uh, or in my case, off-white on rice. Um, <laughs> And I just really just try to learn as much as I could, uh, but extremely powerful, hard work ethic. Um, and then, uh, of course, Sidney Pollack, rest in peace. I worked with him on The Interpreter with Nicole mm-hmm. Kidman and Sean Penn. And this is a man who was just so 
he has such understated power. Like he, he ran this set, but, but he did it with a whisper. And you don't have to yell at anybody. You don't have to be a dick. You just have to know what you want and deliver the message uh, with passion and commitment and authenticity. And he did that. And he knew how to speak to different actors mm. uh, as if they were each a fingerprint. Uh, and I was nervous. I was working with Nicole Kidman and he's an Oscar winner. And I was just, I was nervous. I was kind of starting out. And he was just like, dude, you got this. You got this. You see that lady over there? And he's talking to Nicole. She's 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 gonna be there for you 100. percent It's just a safe place to work. So just take a deep breath and jump. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. That was it. You were done. I was just. I was so moved by that. I. I still fucked up, but it's still. I was just very. <laughs> I mean, you you almost brought the whole movie down, but but you, but at least you yeah. felt safe. But but he was so generous too. Like he told me, I said, "What about if I?" Because I was work, I was doing the scene with her, and I'm like, I'm like the sound man in this booth, right? And I said, uh, "What if uh, she gives me the line? Can I leave my violin here?" And I say, "Number one, stop flirting. It's not going to happen." <laughs> And he laughed. He's like, that's absolutely ridiculous, but I want to shoot it. So, you know, this was a an, an $100 million movie. Right. And he gave me the generosity of shooting that. And I just, I don't know, I'll never forget him. Did it make, did it make the cut? No, of course not. It was absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. But he gave me the time of day. And he respected my idea. And, he, and you know, he believed He's... in me enough to shoot it. Uh, so, I mean, they were spending three hundred thousand dollars a day on that movie. Oh yeah. So each take is pricey, uh, and but he still let me do it. So. And Nicole, I'm assuming, you. and I'm assuming Nicole uh, cracked up. <laughs> well, she was like, <laughs> that, "That's amazing." Yeah, Sydney. Sydney was. I mean, he was a master, and and you know, I've seen those directors who just just their mere presence commands attention and there yeah. it's kind of like you know when you're Sidney Pollock you know everybody knows you're on set just by you walking on it yeah. it's one of those things now yeah. you you know you've worked as an actor for many years now and one of the things that actors have to deal with a lot is rejection what is the mechanism that you use to deal with that? Because I mean, it's I mean, as a director, when I when I do castings, I'm trying to be as nice and and kind to to actors as possible. But you guys go, you know, sometimes on, especially when you were starting out, you know, five or ten castings a day, and you're rejected from almost all of them, if not all of them, almost on a daily basis. And you, so you go through a hundred. I know. I'm sorry. I don't, stop crying. Stop crying. Stop crying, agent. Um, it's. <laughs> But no, but like out of a month, you might get one. You might land one if you're lucky. How do you deal with the rejection, man? Oh my god, I'm having that Oprah moment. Um, <laughs> um, dude, this is the life I chose, and like my mother would say, nobody's forcing you. Um, <laughs> she, it's true. She would crook her finger like Gollum. Nobody's forcing you. Right. <laughs> Thanks, ma. Um, but look, resilience, that's all it is. I was watching this documentary with uh, Rita Moreno. Yeah. yeah. The, one that, the one that just came out. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And she was like, uh, you know, because she admits that she was actually raped right. by her agent when she was just a, a teenager. And, Kid, and yeah. she fought through that, fought through that, and fought through the racism and the ageism and the this and the that. And they asked her how. It's just, you have to be resilient. That's it. Resilience. There's no, and some people have a capacity for that more than others. Uh, and I understand that. Uh, a lot of my friends no longer are no longer in the business, and I, I respect that. But you just have to fight and be resilient. And I think that's uh, something that every every person in every part of our business needs to understand, from directing to gripping to screenwriting to acting. It is resilience, and and that's what they don't teach you in film school. And they don't announce that. They don't sell that. It's Hollywood doesn't sell you that. They sell you the. the I always say they have. They're really great at the sizzle, but they suck at the steak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. 
Now, you you also uh, worked with um, with one of the biggest movie stars, if not the biggest movie star in, in the world at the time, with Will Smith as a co-star on Focus. Were there any valuable lessons you learned from working with uh, with Will and, you know, just being around someone who is so not only so famous, but how he works and how he got to where he is. Any valuable lessons you learned? Uh, two quick stories about him. I, uh, my first day, uh, it's a scene. I'm in an ambulance on a gurney and sitting over me is Margot Robbie and Will Smith. <laughs> and we have no air in this ambulance. We have lights right over us. And I'm like in a polyester suit and I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm sweating my ass off. And Will Smith reached into his pocket, took out his personal handkerchief and dabbed the sweat off my head. And that was day one. We were in New Orleans and I'll never forget it. And I said to myself, I'm going to be good on this movie. I'm going to be safe because if the biggest star in the world had the humanity to do that. I'm going to be good. Um, so that's Will Smith that you don't read about. Um, but he is like a parade float. He is larger than life. When we were in Buenos Aires, he came out of his trailer and just like throngs of people like the Beatles just came after him. Um, but what he taught me is treat everybody, everybody with respect. Everybody. Because you don't know who they are or where they've been. And he didn't, he didn't tell me that, but he showed me that just by dabbing my forehead. That's a great, great, great lesson. Now, I want you to tell me, so uh, you, you've been talking about I Gilbert for a couple years now. I remember, you know, we, we threatened to work with each other a little bit on that on the post end uh, when you guys were trying to get something going uh, or finishing up the film. Uh, how, tell me, first of all, tell me about the film, uh, I Gilbert. What is it about? Well, it's a personal story for me because I, there was a long time in my life when I felt completely disconnected to everyone. Just just being Latino in this business, being a big guy, walking into, you know, a, 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 a drugstore and just having people like, you know, look at you just because you're big or whatever. And I just kind of like let that simmer inside me. And then one day I'm on the subway in New York and there's this guy sitting opposite this attractive woman and he starts just taking pictures of her and then he he kept doing it and she's like what the heck? what are you doing he didn't say anything he was just dead and then he got off the next stop and I thought to myself who is this guy that he is so dead on the inside that he could you know dehumanize someone in that way and just keep moving. So that stayed with me. And then, of course, I have a daughter. You know, she just turned a teenager. And I'm like, who is she going to wind up with mm. if this is the dating pool? You know? <laughs> and <laughs> I know the feeling, brother. I know the feeling. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I, you know, I reached a point as a person and as an actor that I just wanted to tell stories that mattered to me. Right. And what I felt was this growing disconnection uh, between people. I mean, listen, we all love our phones and we all love social media, but it can be very isolating. Uh, so just like in Taxi Driver, the metaphor for loneliness was the taxi. Today, to me, it's the phone. Um, and so that's how I started cultivating the story. And uh, how did you, uh, how long ago did you start this process? I wrote this baby 10 years ago. Wow, man. And I, and I shot it in 2016 and 2020. I had to do reshoots last in 2020. Uh, and then post-production was a real pain in the ass. I couldn't find the right composer. Mm -hmm. the, the music was so essential to this movie. Um, but finally, it was an act of God because I was, I was in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I was shooting Lady in the Trap, uh, the remake. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm just walking around and I see uh, Leonard Malton, the film critic, 
heading towards the screening uh, over at SCAT. Uh, and I just like Linda Malton. So I walked up to him. I said, Mr. Malton, I love your books. They were really instrumental to me. I just wanted to say hello. And uh, he said, thank you. Thank you so much. And he was with his family, a couple of friends. And I was so desperate. I just blurted out. Um, does anybody know a little composer? <laughs> it's Leonard Moulton. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, like it was a total non sequitur. Uh, but I was just so like, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I need a composer. I need a composer. I was acting the subway guy. Like, I need a composer. Do you know composers? Uh, um, and then somebody said, oh, I know somebody in New York. His name is Gil Tommy. Okay. Gil Tommy. And I went to Apple Music and I started Gil Tommy. And I heard this song that he wrote called Time Like Rain. And it was like a lightning bolt. It was just like, that's, that's the tone of the song. That's the tone of the music I need for this, for this movie. That's it. I reached out to him. And the rest is history. He and his partner, uh, Gisela Fula Silvestri, she's from Spain, composed the most gorgeous score. It is uh, beautiful. When you see the movie. Yeah, it's a beautiful score. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I kept trying to trip him up. Like, it's got to be sexy, haunting, sad, but beautiful. Like, I just kept throwing And creepy, things. but fast, but and yet creepy. slow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I swear, he like took a leak, came back, and boom, there was this fantastic score. Uh, and props to to my wife, Emmy C, who who wrote the the, uh, the end crawl song and the song in the flashback. Uh, but that was it. Man. We were off and running after I got that score. So how how did you get the funding for the film? Well, that was hard. That was hard. Uh, <laughs> That was the hardest thing I've ever done. I moved the money from savings to checking. <laughs> did you finance this? You self-finance this yourself? I did. Oh, uh, man. Which I don't recommend. I, I don't <laughs> recommend. Uh, I told my kid, listen, the good news is daddy's making a movie. The bad news is you're not going to college. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. But isn't it isn't it amazing though as as filmmakers, you know, I, I call it the beautiful sickness because we you know, once you get bitten by the bug, you're done. You can't get rid of it. It's it's in your blood, you it can go dormant for years and still pop its ugly head somewhere. And I, I had I had I had a director on the show who literally uh mortgaged his home for his first film. The yep. movie bombed. He lost his home. He had seven kids. Had to move back in with his parents and his seven kids and his wife. And he said, the only thing I could think of is like, oh my God, I'm never going to get to direct another movie. And I'm like, that's that's sick. That's that's absolute sickness. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's, it's actually, for me, it was the same thing. I had property in New York. I sold it to finance the movie. Uh, and I have no regrets because for me, the choice was Am I going to be an actualized landlord collecting rents or am I going to be an actualized filmmaker? Wow. Living my bliss. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. And, you and gotta, the money will come back. Yeah, you know, if you look. You, Don't worry about it. it. Exactly. Exactly. You did it. So it. Uh, so. But you. So what took you so long then? If you had if you had the funding, why did it take so long from the moment you wrote it to the moment it's been released almost 10 years later? Because at first I did try crowdfunding. Uh, I tried all kinds of, you know, I reached out to friends in the business. I, you know, I went the route that you would because who really wants to, you know, but it, it just came clear that, you know, it wasn't going to happen. And then uh, I had a window and I said, that's it. I'm just going to shoot it. And you just and you and then you grabbed you grabbed a few of your friends as actors and brought them in and uh, amazing cast by the you way, know, great cast. Well, I feel like this is the best thing Dasha Polanco's done. Um, mm -hmm. With all due respect to our interest in New Black, she she just gives such a subtle, powerful mm -hmm. performance. It's Very beautiful. Like, it's beautiful. It's haunting. It's almost it's, haunting. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you get people like Mojam Arnaud from House of Cards coming in, helping me out. She was terrific. Monique Kernan as the doctor. I love her. She's going to be 
uh, on the show Ghost now. Uh, mm -hmm. She just was on Power as a regular. Just good people, you know, good people. And of course, Raul Castillo, who, who I met on a movie called uh, Don't Let Me Drown that went to Sundance. Mm -hmm. And we always just stayed in touch. And I'm like, dude, he's a creep, but I need you to bring that heart you bring to everything. And he did. It was terrific. Now, as a director, you know, there's always that day on set that you feel like the entire world is coming crashing down around you. You're like, oh my god! It actually, happened every day. <laughs> so what am I? <laughs> what, what am I doing here? I'm gonna lose all my money. Uh, uh, you know, and and it could be for many different reasons. What was that? What was one of the many days of that, that you had on the set? And how did you overcome those those moments? Because it's it's crippling. I've had it. I mean, I've literally had panic attacks when I was first yeah. directing. It's 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 horrible. Yeah, um, but it's also wonderful because yeah. you're telling your story. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, the way I was able to do it was like I, I shot sh some short films in college. And so I said to myself, I'm going to do one short film a day. Okay. That's it. I'm doing one short film a day. And I did that 20 days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I said to myself, like, I remember one time we had, we had a scene change and wardrobe forgot, you know, the change of clothes. <laughs> and she was in Chelsea. We were in Harlem. It was rainy. Everything just sucked. And we were just sitting around, mm. just kind of like waiting for the clothes. And I said, uh, let's just grab the camera and let's just walk the streets and do some pickup shots. And in those pickup shots, we, you know, I found some, some real gems. And it, it reminded me of uh, uh, who directed Babo? Was it Inari 2? Oh, uh, Internet 2. Yeah, Internet 2. Yeah. He was like, you know, just shoot. Like, the screenplay is like the newspaper. It just changes every day. Just go out. If you see something interesting, just shoot that. And be open to the miracles. So I was. And uh, I wound up having some really nice shots. Kind of like B-roll stuff that uh, that we use while waiting. You just got to keep going. Now there's there's some shots in the movie uh, that I you know I know because obviously this is not a hundred million dollar movie so I know you didn't get to lock off Grand Central's uh, or uh, is it, not Grand Central is it Grand Central Jason what's the name of, yeah. yeah Grand Central yeah Grand Central right so I know you didn't lock off Grand Central and I know there's scenes in like you know that has a lot of production value I'm assuming some of that was quote unquote stolen <laughs> mm, not Grand Central. How did you do it? Yeah, how did you do? How did you do the Grand Central scene, man? They will not let you in there. Uh, you gotta, you gotta get permission, uh -huh. and you gotta pay them okay. because they have their own movie person. Okay, okay. Uh, one night, and that was eight thousand dollars. Wow. Shoot there. Yeah, and I, for that you get a platform, you get access to one train not in use, um, and you get access <clears throat> to the main area, but they won't lock it off. So. Oh, so there were people, people th th those were real people just walking around. Yeah. Um, and then um, I said, okay. Now, originally in the cast, Kilbert gets his phone and he, uh, he nervously uh, is recording someone. And then he, he drops it into a subway track. Oh. And, and originally I had it in his mind that he goes into the track. Mm-hmm to get the phone as a train comes by and oh, yeah. jumps out of the way. And the MTC say, the MTA said, no fucking way. Uh, because <laughs> they were like, we don't want copycats uh, of any of that. Um, so then I had to improvise. I said, okay. He just records the person and he walks away. And then the stress of it, because he's not in good health. Uh, overcomes him and he passes out and that's the movie that's the scene in the movie you see but originally it was uh, a different kind of trauma well there was um i mean for eight thousand dollars actually that's not bad a f mm, price it's gorgeous i mean i mean for what you get i mean try to build that set <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know the production value is not that bad for a day and they get you get the train and the it's not a bad it's not a bad deal uh but there were some yeah. scenes that were on the street uh i'm assuming you kind of run and gunned it a lot of the, a lot of those kind of scenes or did you 
Uh, did you always have a permit? You always had permission? Because I mean, I, I've talked to I've, I've talked to filmmakers who made hundred million dollar movies that run and gunned it. <laughs> so yeah, no, a lot of it was run and gunned, and, and but but sometimes if you're going to shoot something that's instrumental to the story, sure. like the Grand Central, you got to just pay the price. Sure, sure. But uh, I mean, but yeah, some of it was run and gunned. And interesting, John Carr, the DP, he had a Segway. And I think that's what you call those things you scoot on. Mm-hmm. And so we would, he would, we would use that for dolly shots. He would just segue <laughs> from one place to the other. And we tried doing that at Grand Central, and they said, "No, you can't use the segue here." Um, <laughs> but uh, is that a, is that a direct uh, impersonation? <laughs> Uh, you can't use yeah, the question's right here. <laughs> um. No, it's so yeah. The segways then is uh, this generation's uh, wheelchair, which was made famous by Robert Rodriguez in Mariachi. You know, using the wheelchair right. as a dolly. Now you can use a segway as a dolly. You put that with a 100%. Ronin. You put that with a Ronin, and you've got like you know almost a technocrane. <laughs> yep. Now, um, what are the skills that you brought as an actor? to the directing in this film like you mean all this experience you've had as an actor were any of those skills used in directing this film well absolutely uh, when speaking to other actors because i get it i know the price they pay right uh, and acting it takes a lot of courage to be an actor because you are lending your emotional life to the character to the story and that process is harder for some than for others so I knew going in how to speak to actors, and I knew each actor's different. Uh, if you're talking to like, and I've seen Morgan Freeman say this, like, what do you want from a director? Nothing. I know what I'm, I know what I'm doing. I don't want anything. All right, that's Morgan Freeman. Other actors want to get deep into conversations about objectives and backstory. Cool. Let's talk about it, you know, as long as you want. Um, on this set, uh, uh, Dasha was very much into Jana. She, she could connect to her story. And we would talk about her body dysmorphia and the character's body dysmorphia. And, and uh, you know, uh, Raul was playing someone who has PTSD. And we wanted to talk about that and, you know, the price you pay. Uh, to be a soldier and then come back out of that and to be back in the regular world and not being able to connect uh, with the people that matter to you. So it was, it was just like each person had their own their own journey to take and you just have to be there. The, that's the thing that a lot of directors, especially young directors coming up, don't understand when working with actors because working with actors is very m- mysterious. It, it's almost like a... It, for many For many, you know, unseasoned directors... They look at what the actors do as as magic almost. Like, how do you just turn it on, turn it off? I think one of the things you just said is so important for people listening to understand is that each actor is different and wants to be spoken to differently. Some come with all the confidence in the world. Give me as little or as much as you want, and you're good to go. Others are much more needy, not needy, but want more interaction with the director. And and some need time to get into scene. Other Others can just pop turn it on like in a dime some are methods some are not but that's such an important part and i'm, I'm assuming you know were you working with the the insane list of actors that you've worked with and collaborated over the years i'm, just, I'm sure you've seen the gambit from everything i just said yeah. right 100 percent. and whatever it is give it to them because at the end of the day people will see the movie see the performances you know that no one's ever said wow i really love the gaffer on this the gaffing was we, fantastic. I mean, I appreciate the gaffer. We can't do it without him. But your movie will sink or swim on the performances. So whatever the, the actors lead on the day, give it to them. Just be there. Without judgment. Just give them what they need. Now, have you... Uh, I'm assuming on your during your, your travels, you've run into performers who might either have given you... Not given you as a director, obviously, but... You've seen actors who've acted up on set or not give, you know, like, you know, either ego or um, insecurity. How do you suggest directors deal with trouble? Like, you know, 
not troublemakers, but just people who might not feel safe. Because I know that for a fact that if, a, if an actor doesn't feel safe, they start acting up sometimes depending on who the actor is and where they are in their career. And others, uh, you know, I just always love to hear any tips that you could hear because I know that's one of the questions I get asked all the time. Like, how do you deal with a difficult actor if they're like the star or if they're just how do you deal with them? So what are your what's your suggestions with that? Well, if you're another cast member, just like walk away and let it let the other people deal with it. This is not sure. your battle, right? If you're the if you're the, if you're the director, you just gotta pull him to the side, and hopefully there's a room somewhere where he you could just let him bend, because you have to keep this, the the space safe for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, one guy going off, it's just not it's just like it just brings everybody down. So if at all possible, you just pull him to the side. Validate his feelings, her feelings, and say, okay, tell me everything you got to say. Just let it out. Just let me hear it. And hopefully the person just needs that moment. I was working on a movie. Where was I? Baton Rouge. And Jeffrey, Jeffrey Tambor lost his shit. I mean, he just went crazy. Uh, and uh, he just totally lost his patience, started screaming at everybody. And the director was just like, Hundred percent. I get it. Yep. yep. And you know, he just went on this ten minute rant. That was it. We went back to this to the shot. And the whole the rest of the day felt icky, you know. Mm -hmm. And the next day he came back, he apologized to the casting crew for everybody. Uh and we moved on. Uh but that rarely happens. I haven't seen too much of that. Jeffrey losses, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah it's my rare and yeah it's my experience is i mean it's you know obviously that's what although the attention goes on to those kind of scenes and you know the like the christian bale you know breakdown and those kind of things oh, okay. yeah but in my experience being on set as much as i've been in my career I, i've never really seen that it, it it that's most of them most people are professionals and they don't act unprofessionally. At certain points, you do have breaking points, and it could be the cast, it could be the uh, the crew, it could be the environment, it could be financial, it could be you just got divorced, uh, it could be um, it could be a million things. It could be a million things. You never know what's going through uh, an actor's head. <laughs> before you just got to keep your side of the street clean. That's it. You know, from the moment you show up, you keep your side of the street clean. You're on time. You're prepared. You work and you go home. That's it. And you do that. That's the discipline. And to me, I wish the whole world was run like a movie set where everybody knew their role. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, nobody complains. We all do our job. And that's it. And you get in and get out and move on. One of the best pieces of advice I ever heard was from a from a I forgot which director told me this, but he's like, if you want to know how actors are feeling, you become best friends with hair and makeup. Because they're the ones that are gonna know they had a rough night. They just broke up with their girlfriend. They, you know, they just got dropped from their agency or, or something like that. You're gonna be the first to know. They're gonna be the first to know. So, always ask hair and makeup. How's Adrian yeah, doing today? They're, they're all like <laughs> therapists too. Like, I mean, I, I, I one time I was a, I was a day player on something, and I sat down, and they're like, "So you married? What's going on?" <laughs> Um, they get, they go right into it, man. And, you know, sometimes they catch you vulnerable when you actually feel like talking about your business and, and you may say things, you know, but, um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good analogy. That's a good piece of advice for anyone listening out there. Make friends with hair and makeup because they will know. And I think you were talking about it earlier. It's like, I think as directors, this is the one thing they don't teach you in film school that we are almost psychology, you know, psychologists. And, and, and therapists on the set because we not only have to deal with the actors and their emotional toll depending on the scene and the character and what they're going through in their own personal life, but you also have to run the set and all of each individual, even crew member has that kind of stuff too. So you've got to kind of, the politics of it all as well is something yeah. they don't teach you. Is that, Do you feel the same way? Yeah, but don't let them see that. I mean, like, oh, you yeah. go to the bathroom and scream and and just like do whatever you got to do but once you're back on set everything is fine <laughs> oh yeah even even if it isn't because they look to you to know where this ship is going 
And so that's really important that you set the tone, you know, like a conductor with an orchestra. You set the tone, man. You set the tone. I love keeping it light. I love keeping it funny. I crack jokes all day and night. Even though we were shooting a drama, I was making jokes all the time. Uh, and, you know, you just got to keep it light and keep it moving. No, no question. I think, uh, and, and that's a great piece of advice because I remember my first film that I shot, uh, day three, I, I excused myself, went to the bathroom, and I literally had a panic attack for 15 minutes and had to go through the whole thing. And I came back out. I'm like, I knew even that that early part of my career, I can't show what's going on if not the whole ship goes down. And right. it's tough. It's not It's not easy being the captain. It's not. <laughs> yeah. But everyone but thinks I mean, they could do know, it better. But everyone thinks they could do it better than you can. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe they're right. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Today, I'm the captain. So. <laughs> For better or worse, we're on the Deal ship. It, you know? yeah. <laughs> now, I always love asking uh, actors who direct how they're able to direct themselves Especially, you, I mean, you're the lead of this movie. So how in God's green earth can you not only direct your first feature film, but then also have the ability to direct yourself, be separated from yourself as far as performance is concerned, be objective? Because uh, I've done it two or three times, and I'm not an actor. And it, ter- it was horrible, horrible experience for me. How did you do this on a day-to-day basis? It comes very easily to me, I, very intuitively. I had no problem with it. I would uh, block the scene and my stand-in, Walter Walter Cruz, would sit in and he would just I'd figure out what we're going to do. Uh, then I would step in, I would perform. Uh, I, you know, I'd maybe take a moment just to kind of like remind myself of what really matters to me in this scene. I'm just kind of like go there and shoot it, cut, check the viewfinder, look at, what the, look at the playback. Okay. Would I be willing to see this in a movie? Is this interesting enough to me? Do I want to make an audience sit through this? Yes? Good. Let's move on. No? Do it again. Um, And that comes easily. What came hard for me was producing. Because Mm. uh, I don't, I mean, I love, you know, having some money, but I don't, I don't like money. Like, I don't like dealing with my taxes. I don't like, (laughs) You know, I don't, I don't like any of that. I just, so I remember like shooting scenes and then just before an emotional scene, I'd, I'd have someone come up to me, Adrian, you have to sign these checks. Oh, like, yep. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I to shoot a scene here. Like, I know, but we, we got to that, 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 that. So, <laughs> so you're signing the checks, uh, that kind of shit just. But writer directed, no, nah, I don't have a problem with that. I, I, and when I was doing my demo reel, uh, shooting commercial, I shot fifty thousand dollar commercial reel back in the nineties when we had to shoot on film, and that drove me nuts. Like, okay, you sign these checks, I had my UPM come over, and I'm like, but I'm in the middle of the creative process, and you need me to sign freaking checks? Like it? No. Yeah. Oh God, it was. It, it's absolutely brutal. But hey, yeah. you know, if you want to get it done, man, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. These are, as long as you, you know, like, because what is it they say? Pain is temporary, film lasts forever. Yep. Yep. It's, you know? it's like, it's like uh, Kubrick used to always say, he's like, we, you know, we're already here. We're all set up. The lights are on. The cameras are here. You know, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just do it again. See, see, see let's just do it again. <laughs> because, I mean, we all, we all got here. This is taking a long time to just to get us here. For this moment, let's take our time. Yeah. Let's do it again. <laughs> God, God bless Shelley Duvall, man. Oh my God, that's oh my God, what she went through in The Shining. Here's to you, Shelley. Shelley, God bless Shelley. Absolutely. If anyone's not seen the making of The Shining, get the Blu-ray, oh, go online. Man. Twenty minutes of just watching Stanley Kubrick. Absolute decimate, poor Shelley Duvall. Oh, I love, I love Kubrick. I oh no, of course. But I think it was but... also. But I think it was also his technique. And I, 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 this is something I've always, I mean, I've heard Coppola do it, um, you know, and other directors do it where they abuse their actors because that's what the feeling they want in the scene or things like that. And I don't, I don't, I don't personally like doing that. Kubrick obviously did it with Shelley. It, you know, for better or worse, it worked because she was an absolute mess in that movie, uh, looking why, you know, what her character was. Uh, I know Coppola tried to do it with, um, with Winona Ryder, 
mm-hmm. on Dracula uh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. What's what's your take on that kind of stuff? I mean, I always like just like let the actors do them. If they if they need me to yell and curse at them, there's something wrong. That's my opinion. What do you think? Again, it's the fingerprint thing. Like, oh, you're right. You're right. If, yeah. if, it, if an actor needs that. And they're okay, okay. with it. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to be abusive. Right. Uh, that's where you draw the line, of course. But sometimes, you know, you do need an actor just, just to be in your face and say, listen, this is what it is. This is what it is. This is the scene where you let her know that you're tired of her fucking bullshit. Mm-hmm. And you need to fucking nail it. Whatever it is. Right, right. And you got to do what you got to do. And then sometimes you go up to an actor and they're like, yeah, I, 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 I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, what what surprised you the most about yourself during the process of directing and producing this film? That I could do it. I mean, I took on a lot. Yeah, I, I took on a lot, uh, and it, it it came at no small price. I mean, there were times when I felt tremendous despair and and terror uh, because the, you know. All kinds of things happened. People came and left. Uh, locations came and left. The food didn't arrive. Meal panel. <laughs> yeah, it just like it was just a, a series of tsunamis that you just have to grab your your your, your, your surfboard and just just keep going. Um, but it affected me. You know, Peter Brooks says actors are athletes of emotion, and. Mm. I feel everything as a person, you know, like I take everything in. So to be able to compartmentalize that as a director, producer, to stand back and see the bigger picture, to allow myself to feel whatever agony I was in or whatever bliss I was in, uh, and just keep coming back the next day as if each day is a miracle. That was That was hard, but I did it. And I did it mostly because of the crew and the cast that backed me up every day uh, without even knowing it, you know, like, and sometimes knowing it, but just knowing that they were there for me, that they believed in the story, that they gave me their time. No one got compensated a lot of money, uh, but they were there. And just just by the fact they were there was was an affirmation of, of my vision and, and the story. And that kept me going. It is the... Um... It is the beauty and the terror of being an artist, is what you've just explained. Is the ups, the, the peaks and the valleys, the bliss and the despair that could happen within a minute, a second of each other. At one moment, at one moment you could be at the highest of the high, and the next moment you could be at the lowest of low, and it could turn on a dime. And and that's a unique, that's unique to the filmmaking art. You know, I'm not sure is, it is like that with photography or with uh, you know painting. I I don't know. Um, even with writing, I definitely think it is, <laughs> as you know, because you wrote this. Um, how long did it take you to write this, by the way? Uh, so I uh, I write very slowly and very quickly, and by that I mean <laughs> I was I was just cooking with this idea for a year or two, and then I banged it out in a weekend. Mm-hmm. So uh, I mean, of course, obviously that was the first draft, and Jose Rivera, who wrote and got an Oscar nomination for The Motorcycle Diaries. Mm -hmm. He's my EP on the movie, and he has a writing group where I brought it in, and I would have other writers for different parts. And uh, Mojan Marneau was in that writing group at the time. Um, I knew I wanted her in the story. I just love her. Mm -hmm. I just love her look, her presence. She's so smart. Um, But yeah. Uh, there, uh, the script took different, you know, uh, stories, different lives. Uh, so, like, eh, let's just call it a year. Okay, fair enough. Now, besides composing, was there any other part of the post-production process that um, you would like to warn filmmakers that have never made a feature uh, about, like, the kind of a couple of hiccups or pitfalls that you might be able to fall into in the post-production process of this? Uh, just remember that when you cast the movie, you're not just casting the cast, you're casting the crew, and you're casting the post-production people. you got to be with people that are highly vetted, that come from personal 
referrals, people you trust. Like it was, it was Oscar winner Shaka King who told me about the Post people uh, in my movie. And he said, yeah, go here, go to this guy. That's it. I believe him. Yeah. I mean, he shot the king. But this is before uh, he blew up. Um, but he, we did a movie together called Newlyweeds mm-hmm. that went to Sundance. Uh, his his first movie. Um, and he's been very, very helpful. I thanked him in the credits. Good man, smart man. Um, but that's that's definitely the the, the truth. You got to really go with people that are vetted and recommended and trust them and work with them. Make sure they're collaborative. Uh, make sure they get what you're trying to get after. Uh, if you get any whiff of, uh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Go walk away. Your bet, bet. Yeah, that's not the one for you. The, um, the, the main question I have to ask you, would you do it again? Yes, but not with my money. <laughs> I think it was Peck and Paw. Is it Peck and Paw or John Ford or somebody? I forgot who it was. Like, never use your own money. Never. <laughs> yeah. I say that, but I just shot a trailer, uh, kind of like a proof of concept for a pilot I'm putting together with my own money. So, you know, <laughs> but that's, I told, I told my wife, that's it. That's it. I, that's it. I'm not going to shoot gonna pilot. Shoot the whole pilot. Yeah. <laughs> For everyone not not watching this, uh, Adrian just rolled his eyes, and uh, which ins- in- insinuates that there <laughs> might be a potential of him using his money. <laughs> uh, it's a sickness, man. Listen, it is the I beautiful just, I, sickness. Well, I just want shit done, man. I don't want. I, I don't like waiting for permission from anybody. I don't like, you know. I mean, obviously there are limits. So I'm not gonna shoot a series for Hulu on my dime, but sure. Um, but. I can shoot a trailer for a proof of concept, and that's what I did. And we'll see how it plays out. Now, uh, you have an, uh, you, you, I think you have an announcement for your next project. Isn't it called Renfield? Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Very exciting. Uh, it just came out on deadline yesterday. I, uh, I'm going to be uh, Aquafina's sidekick in this movie. Um, <laughs> so it's me and Aquafina versus. Nicholas Cage as Dracula, and oh Nicholas, God. and I—I I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Forgive me, Nicholas Hout, uh-huh. Hout, okay, uh, as Renfield. It's—it's going to be good. It's directed by Chris B- Chris McKay, who did uh, Tomorrow Wars. Uh, he's really smart. Oh wow! It's going to be funny. It's gonna scare the shit out of people. Uh, it's gonna be good. It's it's Nick. This it's Nick Cage. Be good. It's I mean it's it's you're gonna work. Be have bad. you worked with Nick? Have you worked with Nick before? I did. Uh, I did a movie uh, called Army of One. Yes. Where he, uh, Larry Charles directed it. I don't think it went anywhere, but it was fun to meet him. It was fun to shoot it. And it's about a guy who who wants to kill Osama bin Laden. So he just like he's like that's this guy. From just the Midwest, dude. just got himself to the Middle East to try to try to kill Osama bin Laden, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the comedy ensued. Um, but yeah, I met, I worked with him. And he's a very nice man, very nice man, and a real artist. People are real. Like, I mean, Nicholas Cage. You know, he went through this patch where he was just doing whatever to make money. But mm-hmm. let me tell you, this guy can act. He's a wonderful actor. Oh, yeah, and. Uh, He's he's got this movie coming out where he plays himself. Like, oh, I can't wait to see it! I can't wait to see it! Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I'm the greatest actor in the world, or so, something like that. It's like it's yeah. an amazing title, and Nick, I think he's yeah. selling like he's acting for like a billionaire off like some yeah. foreign billion. Oh, I saw the trailer. I was just like, yes, please, yeah. can I have a double? I mean, I just I can't get enough of Nick. I think Nick is. Yeah, no, we're at a, we're at the precipice of another another Nicholas Cage Renaissance, and Renfield's part of that. And I'm really psyched. Oh, that's amazing! Uh, I, I can't, yeah. I can't wait to see you, uh, you work with him. And Aquafina, she's, I mean, she's amazing oh, right now. She's, I love her. Yeah, I just saw her in Shang Chi, and and she, she like steals this. every scene she's in. She steals it. She's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, she's absolutely. I'm fantastic. just gonna try to hang in there. That's it. <laughs> now, where can people uh, see uh, I Gilbert? 
It's everywhere streaming right now. So Amazon Prime and iTunes and movies and uh, YouTube and IMDb TV. Like it's everywhere streaming. So just write I Gilbert and enjoy the movie and let me know how you feel at my uh, Instagram, Taste of Adrian. Which is a fantastic handle, by the way. <laughs> I've always loved that handle. I mean, it's just a taste, you know. Just, yeah. we, we can't take all. Of, we can't take all of the Adrian in. It's too much. No. It's too much. Too much. You have to take well, a taste. A taste. It's a taste of Adrian. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Don't waste time. Time is the enemy. Time doesn't give a fuck. Time just keeps moving on. Uh, so grab your phone. If you don't have a camera, just grab your phone, shoot. Don't make excuses. No one's interested. Uh, just, oh, I don't know how to write. Find somebody who does and collaborate. Just keep going and don't waste time. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Don't waste time. <laughs> I wasted so much time. That's why I'm saying this. Um, uh, absolutely. And also be professional. I mean, you know, we all know this, but uh, it really matters to be kind. Like people remember kindness more than anything. Well, the best advice I ever got in the film business is don't be a dick. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a really yeah. people underestimate yeah. that. By the way, yeah. on your first interview, I asked you that question. You know what your answer was? Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> eat, eat salads? I can't remember. It was, I'm enough. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm enough. And I was like, wow. It just hit me like a ton of bricks when you said that. And most people yeah. don't realize. They, they, they go through their whole life thinking that they're not enough. But when you realize that you are enough... It's pretty liberating. So I thought it was, I just wanted to bring that back because it was such a wonderful answer. And it was the first time anyone had ever said that on the show. It, many people have said it afterwards. They probably all stole it from you, sir. But, um, <laughs> but it was a very profound answer. So I wanted to, pre I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, Alex. I mean, not only are you enough, but who else can you be? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, mean, I forget who said it. Like, I think it was Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> awesome. So amazing. It's really, it's really about embracing who you are and bringing that gift and trusting it, trusting who you are, and just really, there's a light inside you that that people want to see. So just get out of your own way and show it. And last question: three of your favorite films of all time. <sighs> Man, as of right now. Well, yep. Well, number one's always Shawshank Redemption. 100%. Amen. Amen. Get, Me too. Kind of like with the theme, you know, like get busy living or get busy dying. Yep. Uh, a special. I love John Cassell. Uh, he's a hugely inspirational actor mm -hmm. to me. Uh, so I think of Fredo and The Godfather. I think of him. Uh, so The Godfathers, one and two. Um, okay, I'll throw in number three because I just feel like. Godfather 3 gets a bad rap, but the new cut I liked a lot. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen the new cut yet, but... Yeah. Uh, it kind of streamlines everything more. Um, I mean, but look, after Godfather 1 and 2, it's really tough. Like, Godfather 1 was a tough follow. Then they beat it with Godfather 2 in many ways, or even equal that or beat it. I mean, how many times can you hit lightning again? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's tough. Yeah. And uh, how many more I got to give? Just one. One more. Shit. Uh, there's a movie called I Gilbert, which I just saw. <laughs> I hear good things it about that one. Really, I hear it fantastic. really spoke to me. Really I, I, hear, I mean, I heard the act that the lead actor was eh, but the rest of the, the, rest of the cast yeah. and the direction was fantastic. <laughs> if you just fast forward his performance, you just really get a, a really classic film. Um, <laughs> Uh, mute, mute his performance. Mute his performance. <laughs> and then just unmute it when he comes off. <laughs> yeah. My friend Adrian, uh, I, I appreciate you coming back on the show. I I wish you nothing but continued success in everything you do. I'm so glad uh, you finally got this film made because you've been talking about it for a while. 
Uh, you've been talking about it for a while, and uh, it has yeah. just been. Uh, I'm I'm just so glad that it's finally done. It's out in the world, and that you survived it. Uh, yeah. And you're threatening to do it again. Uh- <laughs> yes. Last man standing. I mean, I swear the Martians could drop a bomb and annihilate the Earth, and out of the rubble, my hand will come with my demo reel, just like. <laughs> Take it to your leader, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And then Will Smith comes out for some strange reason some, from somewhere. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Always. To save the day. To save the day. Uh, yeah. Adrian, continue success, my friend. A pleasure as Thank always. You, Alex. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Don't wait four years again. This is-